I love you guys all the pieces and I love his company and I would have music behind me because my friend Hamid of South Africa just had his visa to the United States cancelled and he's never to see me in a couple of weeks. I thought I'd play music in the background from him while I'm waiting for So quiet you can't hear all that. It's really quiet. It's about something to Anyway, I'm just going to read bombs. Sorry, there you go. <laughs> because I lost my chance here. Thank you so much. Boxy's Cindy on the edge. I'm going to start with a mellow one. Short one called One by One the Beach Trees Fell. I've lived in this grove all my life. The beautiful trees have always lined the roads. The, the beach trees even line the drive to my home. Everything was blooming by the end of May when they came in from the coast, from, the, from our home, and we didn't have the war coming here. Could hear noises in the distance one morning. He told me that some of the trees had already been felled by the General Field Marshal's urgent orders. Rommel was sure an attack was imminent, so they couldn't leave trees for enemy hideouts. And so they fell our trees, one by one. Looked out in the front door, saw the strip land. These trees have souls, and but no one actually mourns for the loss of a species that's been on this land longer than we. And they didn't do this everywhere. I hear some of them, they left some of them up in the field so that glider planes would be destroyed while they were landing. Which lives they were saving, I thought, as the soldiers continued doing their job after the beech trees fell. Human construct of time. Is this the best of times? Is this the worst of times? Or is this just one of those times? Only humans understand time. Where did all the time go? We all ask. Time slips away as we search for ways to avoid looking old, to avoid death. If I ever saw God, I'd have to ask, how old are you? Uh, how much longer are you just going to sit there and observe? <laughs> but time is a human construct. I have to keep reminding myself as I sit and think of times like these. <laughs> This one is performance art book called Chapter 48, Line 1. And this one's called The Moon. Six line. The moon is a hypnotist, putting people in a trance. Whenever you look at it, moonlight takes over your soul. No one can stop it, but no one wants to. <laughs> And then pull up one for you. This one is called the State of the Nation. Here we go. Here we go. My phone rang earlier today, and I picked it up, and I said, hello. And the man at the end of end said, is this Janet Kuypers? And I said, yes, this is. May I ask who's calling? And he said, hi, this is Washington, and I'm sitting here with Jefferson, and we just wanted to tell you a few things. And I said, well, 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 why me? And he said, excuse me, I believe I said I was the one that wanted to do the talking. God, that is a problem with Americans nowadays. They're all so damn rude. And I said, you know, you really didn't have to use language like that. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. It's just that I've been dead for so long. I lose all control of my manners. Well, anyway, we just wanted to tell you a few things. Now, I know we didn't have much of an idea of what we were doing when we were starting up this country here. I mean, we didn't have much experience in creating bodies of power. But I know how our constitution could be misconstrued. And then he put in a dramatic pause, and he said, 
But when people like when we said that people have a right to bear our arms, we want to protect yourself from a government gone wrong, and not so that you can kill a innocent person for twenty dollars cash. And when we said the freedom of freedom of religion, we included the notion of the separation of church and state, because freedom of religion could mean freedom from religion. And when we said freedom of speech, we had no idea you'd be burning the flag, or painting pictures of Christ doused in urine, or, or photographing people with whips of their respective anatomies, but, but hell, I guess we've got to grin and bear it, because if we ban that, the next thing they'll ban is books. And I said, but there are schools that have books banned, George. And he said, oh. <laughs> Alright, I've got one from Chapter 48, Volume 2 for you guys, and this one is from a show that I did here in Austin. Part, this, that first one was from Volume 1, and this is Volume 2, oh yeah. And this is right into a show in, in, uh, here in Austin, and it's called Yearning to Break Free. Asked a guitarist once why he's always breaking into song. He told me that he, his head had to be filled with music or else billions of ideas would overflow his brain and he couldn't be able to concentrate or focus on anything. I, I thought about this, and I wonder if this is the place of the creative, that we're bombarded with all these ideas. They, they attack us, they assault us, they bombard us, they infect our brains. And then every once in a while, we let one crystallize. And we, you, we call our scattered minutia form, we give the form and you call it a work of art. Uh, but you don't understand, if I let it all out, my brain would explode. I suppose that is the trials of the creative, with all of these ideas scratching at our brains, trying, yearning to break free. And us creative types are left to pick and choose from what is deep within us is worth sharing with the rest of the world. You call it art. I call it what keeps me sane. I am going to end with one piece here that is in a book of interviews and journal entries and select poems over many years and I like ending on this one for you. This poem is called On a High Horse Like This. I listen to a hunter from Africa say, all life is sacred. And he said this after separating a small, thin, non-venomous snake from around a large African hawk-like bird's neck. Because, you see, the bird attacks snakes, and the snake wouldn't be able to eat this bird once it had died. That would be a senseless death. <laughs> All life is sacred, you say. So I couldn't help but think, as a hunter, do you pray for the sacred dead after you've killed it? <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, I, I mean, I don't usually vocalize when I get on a high horse like this. And, and I've had to explain myself to meteors that, that no, these are not leather shoes I'm wearing, I'm a vegetarian. Even though I still have to feign a smile and commiserate with men eating slaughtered animal. Because, you see, I'd look like a fool for having beliefs. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear an opinion that's different from their own. I mean, we're Americans. If it's not human, or maybe a dog or a cat, eat it. It's that simple. But I married a hunter, a marine, who served our country. And he told me that every time he killed an animal, a part of them felt a regretful twinge of pain when he killed his prey. The prey that he searched for with the weapon that he could use before anything could ever get close enough to actually be an enemy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting on my high horse again. <laughs> yeah, it's convenient that people can get their kill from a grocery store without getting any blood on their hands. Anything to stop people from thinking about what they're doing. Because I've heard that killing something makes you feel something. And I thought...
Thank you. Thank you.